models from the we have them online um, but we also follow that up this this presentation with an expert debate i come back to that later on then we have a short coffee break because if you have a network event you need coffee breaks you know? uh, uh, so then we can talk a little bit informally uh, further and then um, 11 15 uh, we are going to look at quality perspectives on micro credentials and we have anna gover director of ENQA, uh, in the room today and she will give a presentation on that and finally uh, our vice president of edu adam Peller, director from the federal university um, gives a talk about inclusion and digital accessibility we wrap everything up and we come to conclusions and solutions hopefully in our closing panel and i come back to that later too and then at 12 30 at the end of this morning we have network lunch it is a very tight schedule i know uh, but uh, we really need also room for uh, discussion and exchange of ideas so have fun i hope really uh, that this will be a very inspiring morning because that's that's our goal to inspire new initiatives uh, for your university and for your campus so ask questions and uh, make comments in the room and of course people online please post your question or your remarks in the chat uh, probably stefan uh, will read them uh, to us sure yeah <laughs> okay so let's kick off with ivana uraga ivana the floor is yours Hello and good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, thanks very much for this uh, lovely introduction. And it's really a pleasure uh, to be here again this year. I was uh, here also last year, and it's uh, nice to see uh, the attendance also rising, both uh, in person and remotely, and uh, to see that there is a really sustained interest uh, in, in getting together. Um, I will take uh, a little bit of time this morning uh, to talk to you about um, the EU's policy agenda when it comes to digital education and uh, skills. Um, I am working in uh, DG uh, Education, Youth, Culture and Sport of the European Commission uh, in the Digital Education Unit. This unit was created uh, about two years ago, so it's still a, a fairly new entity, but we have been very busy uh, in the last two years. Um, and our main policy agenda is the Digital Education Action Plan. Um, as usual for digital education, uh, our starting point is the COVID pandemic, even though we all know that it wasn't the starting point and that digital education was already very much present uh, around Europe and around the world, it still marked a significant change in how it was viewed. Um, and it increased the, uh, significantly the number of uh, teachers and learners, uh, staff and students who experienced it, many of them for the first time in their life. Uh, we know that higher education institutions were relatively better prepared uh, for uh, the, the rapid shift to distance learning. Uh, and uh, obviously those in the room here were very well prepared and didn't need to shift. Uh, at the same time, uh, the challenges still remain uh, very high. The latest data that we have shows that only 54% of Europeans have at least basic <laughs> digital skills. And here we are really talking about basics, which means uh, that we still have 46% of 
adults in the EU who don't even have the very basic uh, digital skills. Uh, obviously, this is of importance to you because it means that they do not also have the skills to learn online and to engage uh, in, in distance learning. Uh, we also know that the situation is not better if we look at younger people. Um, we know that every third eighth grader is underachieving when it comes to computer and information literacy. This is a skill that we now consider as essential um, as reading mathematics and other basic skills. But this also means that the, the learners who are coming into university, who are often assumed by default because they are growing up in a digital age, to have these skills and to come in with them, simply don't have them. Uh, it is very clear from research that just growing up surrounded by, by screens uh, does not make you digitally literate. So it means that there is also an onus on higher education institutions to make sure that their learners are equipped with those skills when they are starting their studies. What we see uh, when we talk to institutions is that uh, universities play, pay, uh, put less emphasis on teaching basic digital skills to their incoming cohorts because they often tend to assume that those skills are already there. But what we know from the research is that that's actually not the case for many of them. At the same time, uh, a vast majority of teaching staff also don't feel uh, prepared to use digital skills uh, in an effective and innovative way in their teaching. And this is something that we also need to work on. So uh, I think you are all already quite well familiar with the digital education action plan that the European Commission adopted in 2020. So I will not uh, go into uh, the details of it. Um, the overarching message is that uh, we need to work better together in an integrated and comprehensive approach towards digital education. What we see in most countries, and we had a similar situation in the, in the European level, was that there was a lot of different initiatives, uh, very good ones, but often rather small in scale uh, and rather limited in time. And, uh, we are now attempting to go towards something that's more structured and, and more uh, integrated. Uh, the action plan has two strategic priorities. Uh, you will see a lot of text on this slide, but it's just to give you an overview. And of course, the slides will be shared afterwards. Uh, the first priority uh, deals with uh, the development of a high performing digital education ecosystem. So all the elements that are needed in order to support uh, the use of digital technologies uh, in education. Uh, you will see from the, the various ticks uh, that uh, a lot of these actions have already been completed, even though we are not even yet halfway through uh, the implementation of the action plan. And it's a similar picture also for the second priority, which focuses on digital skills. Um, like I said, many of these actions are already well on their way. Those are the ones with the little arrows or already com fully completed, the, the ones with the green ticks. Uh, and we still have some, some years to go until 2027, which is the duration of the action plan. Next year, we will be uh, conducting a midterm review of the action plan to see uh, how the implementation has gone and also to see what other priorities uh, we might need to focus on in the future. So uh, in the next few minutes, I would just like to mention a few major deliverables that we have had uh, over the past period. Firstly, at the end of last year, we published two sets of uh, guidelines for teachers and educators, one on the ethical use of artificial intelligence and data in teaching and learning. Um, I know that one of the sessions after me will also be uh, dealing with AI, uh, so it's certainly become a very hot topic in the, the last few months. Uh, these guidelines were published uh, before uh, that kind of storm exploded, uh, but we tried to make them as general as possible and uh, as practical as possible, because we know that technology will be evolving much more rapidly than our policies can, so we tried to when we produce such documents, make them general enough that they can be applied to also new developments in technology. Um, 
these guidelines are really trying to be hands-on, giving practical examples and guidance uh, to, to teaching staff that they can use uh, directly in, in their everyday life. Um, and they are available in all the EU languages. Uh, the same goes for the second set of guidelines, uh, which are for teachers and educators to promote digital literacy and tackle disinformation. Obviously, another crucial topics, um, another crucial topic. Um, both sets of guidelines were developed by an expert group that was uh, selected through an open call. Um, and they work together again to make a product that is practical and that uh, can be directly used in education. And then the second uh, package that I want to talk about is uh, the recent, very recent digital education skills package, which the European Commission adopted uh, on the 18th of April uh, this year. Um, so a bit more than a month ago. Uh, and this was in response to uh, our ongoing efforts on these two strategic priorities. We call them two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, we have the education ecosystem, all the preconditions that are needed to leverage digital technologies to improve quality uh, and inclusiveness of education in general. And on the other hand, we have the digital skills. So uh, in spring this year, we adopted a package consisting of two proposals for council recommendations. Um, these two proposals are now adopted by the European Commission and the next step will be for the council to discuss them with all the member states giving their inputs. And we hope that by the end of the year, the council will adopt uh, the formal council recommendations, which will then go into implementation. Uh, the first one has a bit of a complicated name. Uh, it talks about the key enabling factors for successful digital education and training. It's basically about the elements that are needed in the system for digital education to be successful. Uh, when we talk about those elements, we think primarily about having a proper strategy for digital education skills but also regularly monitoring its effectiveness and updating it. We talk about involving stakeholders, supporting education and training staff. There we think about not only teaching staff, but also the leaders of institutions uh, and also the administrative support staff. All of these actors have to be on board in order to have a, a successful digital transformation in any level of education. And finally, all of this needs to be underpinned by investment as a crucial element. The second proposal for a council recommendation talks about specifically the provision of digital skills in education and training. I mentioned earlier on that we still have uh, a very large gap uh, when it comes to even basic digital skills. This is not even talking about uh, what we call applied mm. digital skills that uh, professionals need and not even going into the ICT specialists or, or the so-called advanced digital skills. In our view, in order for this to be tackled, the education and training system has to have an important role and has to step up how it teaches digital skills from, uh, from the earliest age. Because if we are not teaching digital skills from an early age, we are then losing also those people who might develop an interest in becoming ICT specialists, in, in learning, um, in, in uh, studying advanced digital um, sciences. Uh, so this is really uh, the key message of this recommendation. So like I said, this package uh, was really a major deliverable of the Digital Education Action Plan. And we are now starting uh, negotiations with the member state representatives and we hope to have uh, the final adopted recommendations uh, by the end of the year. And finally, before I leave you, uh, I cannot uh, go without mentioning the European Digital Education Hub, uh, which is one of our proudest achievements of the Digital Education Action Plan. It is a community of practice that we are nurturing online to bring together all stakeholders uh, who have an interest in digital education, uh, training skills uh, at any level of education. 
Um, and uh, as usual, if you are not already a member, I would very warmly uh, welcome you to join. It's very easy, just uh, there is a link on our website uh, and uh, anyone is uh, welcome to join uh, as an individual or as a representative of their institution. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention um, and wish you a successful continuation of the conference. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, of course, we have time for questions, uh, remarks, and comments. Anybody? That's still early in the morning. Oh, bye. <laughs> Um, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. And um, we are um, heads of open universities in Europe. And I was thinking we are the specialists for <coughs> educating large cohorts of students that may be the first generation learners. So exactly what you say, these basic skills in digitalization. Uh, so what role could this association play in your European lens? Um, so when we were preparing this recent package uh, that was adopted this spring, we had a lot of uh, consultations uh, and I think uh, uh, many of you were also involved in those. I think that the key message uh, that we are trying to send in both uh, council recommendations is that everybody needs to get involved. Um, what we have seen uh, a lot uh, is that uh, especially digital skills are very fragmented because people are getting involved and various institutions are getting involved. Uh, but if you look at, for example, one country, you might find uh, five or six different strategies, one for digital skills in the economy, one for digital skills for the elderly, uh, you know, uh, maybe even for different sectors of the labor market. Um, and the message we are trying to pass on to governments is that all of this needs to come together uh, to improve the synergies uh, that, that could be made uh, and also to avoid overlaps and, and uh, uh, really to, to improve the effectiveness um, of, of the work that everyone is doing on digital skills. So my message would also be uh, for your institutions to try to see how they can how you can work maybe better together with other sectors, with uh, the economy, with the non nonprofit sector, uh, and so on, because this is also one of the uh, issues that we see that, that could benefit more. Uh, we, we see from the private sector as well that they are very eager to get involved. But of course, there is always a sort of tension and, and hesitancy. Um, but I think in, in digital education skills, we have to accept that they are one of the players and we need to find a way to work with them in a, in a structured way, um, which also then allows education institutions to protect their own interests. Yeah, I was a little surprised uh, when I see the numbers around teachers. You, you say that 16% of the teachers feel the need for uh, uh, new training, development, continuous uh, improvement of their competencies in uh, the IT field. 16%. So does that mean that 84% uh, doesn't feel the need? And on, on the other hand, you said 39% feel ill prepared of the teachers. I think uh, we have a problem with our teachers. Uh, and teacher training, because if you, I don't know uh, here in the room, but uh, if I look at teacher preparedness in the field of ICT, also in the elementary schools and, and, and up, the level of uh, understanding is really, really low. And um, I, I, I understand broad programs, but why not just make it dedicated? Uh, if the teacher level uh, on, on ICT skills is higher, then they are also prepared to send out the message and prepare their pupils, etc. But why not make it more to the point uh, related to certain audiences like teachers? It's actually 39% felt well prepared, so it's even oh. even worse oh. <laughs> the situation. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I'm I I am fully on board there, and one of the big chapters of um, one of the council recommendations is precisely on teachers, 
So the, the whole chapter is really about how to stimulate countries to prepare teachers better. Um, there is obviously, it's a complex issue and there's a lot of questions to be tackled there. Maybe one, one thing I would mention, I spent the last year talking to um, stakeholders from all 27 uh, EU member states. Uh, and one thing that I heard was that uh, in higher education, teachers are less motivated to work on their ICT skills than they might be in other sectors of education. Also because you know, they are spending a lot more time on their research duties and others, and teaching is maybe not always the biggest priority. So I think there is something there for higher education to do as well. Um, but I would add also that we have to be careful not to put everything on teachers because we know obviously I'm working in digital education and this is my priority but I have colleagues who work on citizenship I have colleagues who work on green skills and we all want teachers to solve all of our problems and I think one of one of the things that is illustrated by those two statistics you mentioned is that it's not always that the offer of training is lacking, but that the motivation or the time to take it up is lacking for teachers. So I think this is also something that we need to work on, actually giving teachers a reason to take this training, mm -hmm. perhaps recognizing the skill, skills that they gain in a different way. And don't want to mention the word micro-credentials, but it is relevant there. Um, and, and also giving them the time to take up the training. You're right, we have to be more modest in that uh, they have to solve every problem of the whole of this room. Other questions? Mm -hmm. I don't know, did you give special attention to learning in the workplace? Because in my experience, more than 90% of things that people learn, they don't learn it in schools or in training institutions, they learn it at the workplace. Mm -hmm. I was thinking how good education and training support that workplace learning for people. Is there just giving special attention to that or not? Our, our remit is the education and training sector. So we, we focused on that, um, less so on, on work based learning, but it still stands with the, the message that. Um, education and training institutions do need to engage with also with the employers um, um, because um, if we look at the statistics on how many people or how many for example SMEs are allowing their uh, employees to undertake work-based learning for digital skills it's also very low uh, and the rates of digitalization in, in small and medium enterprises are also still below what we would like them to be so it's definitely an important element it is not the main element that we're focusing on here. Thank you. Thank you. yeah i think uh when you want I want to indicate that it's not only on the shoulders of the teachers and so on, I think also on, on, on leadership of an organization in the sense that everything has to do with the cultural change also about, you talk about innovations and risk taking, um, about the teachers also, uh, so there must be room for that and also the culture in your, in your organization that, uh, that there's a potential also to uh, guarantee quality mm -hmm. and innovation, risk taking, that there's a cultural, culture of change. Um, Supporting the digitalization. Yeah, I absolutely agree, agree 100 percent The problem is that culture is the the most difficult thing to change. But indeed, I think you are absolutely right there that institution leaders have a key role there. Um, and what we see also from research is that if the institution leader is on board, then um, it makes a big difference also for the whole institution. So it trickles down. Okay, can you just for one second uh, tell us a little bit more about the governments? How are they doing? How are they contributing to this? Because every country has its own opinions, policies, etc. How well are they prepared and willing to work in this? 
So I think we are in a really amazing period when it comes to digital education skills. We are still um, on this momentum that was uh, brought about by the pandemic. And we still see a huge willingness from countries um, to make an effort in this respect uh, and also to work together. Um, as you know, I'm, as I'm sure you all well know, uh, education is not an EU competence. Uh, we can only support the coordination, exchange of good practices and so on. But when it comes to digital in the last few years, what we've seen again and again is countries uh, coming to us and saying, we want to work together. We are all facing the same problems and we want, you know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel ourselves. Um, so I think it is really a, a great moment uh, where there is a lot of willingness on the side of governments as well. One thing that uh, we are now starting to develop is what we call a whole of government approach. Um, we are trying also to, to make clear the message that uh, the digital transformation in education cannot happen only coming from the education ministry. It needs to involve the labor ministry. It needs to involve the Ministry of Infrastructure, uh, Economics, Finance as well, because these are major investments we're talking about as well. Um, and what we saw when we talked to countries and we asked them to bring all these actors together in one room, very often they would tell us, this is the first time we've all met at the national level. This is the first time I'm meeting my colleagues from the Ministry of Infrastructure, even though they depend on the work that yeah. those colleagues do. So I think that's something that's starting now uh, and it's it's being seen as a positive development and I hope we can, we can continue in that direction. It's really good to hear. Thank you very much. Ivana, thank you for the kickoff of this wonderful day. Um, uh, of course, you're still uh, around also during the breaks, uh, so that so please go up to her and uh, have your discussion. Uh, thank you very much for now. So we continue with the next presentation: generative AI and a large language model in digital education. Uh, a large language models uh, that that's meant with ChatGPT being in all this AI stuff. Uh, we have a presentation uh, kickoff uh, uh, from Mike Sharples from Yoga University. So Brussels is calling uh, the UK. I hope he's online. And after that, we have next. Hi. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Can you say something, Mike? Hi. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Well, not perfectly yet. Just a second. Mm. Just going to try something. It's always funny if I hear uh, somebody mm. in the room. Oh. Oh, uh, what's more, Mike? Okay. Can you, can you hear me all right now? Can you it's not me? ideal, but I think. Uh, yeah. It's uh, good, good enough, I think. So uh, yeah, sorry for that. Go ahead, Mike, please. Okay. Um, well, I'm, uh, and can you let me just uh, share my screen to start, and then so let me just see. Um, can you see that screen now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh -huh. Excellent. Um, well, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, and I have quite a short time um, to give this introduction presentation, so I'm going to press on and apologize if I skip over a lot, but there's a lot to get through. So generative AI and language models, um, one of the first things to say is that it's moving very rapidly. There are new tools, uh, new technologies, uh, new concerns arising almost every day. So the first thing I want to do is just to give a, uh, an overview of where we are, particularly around ChatGPT4, which is the, uh, the best known and still um, the larger scale model. So ChatGPT version 4, it's a highly trained conversational agent 
text completer style copier, it can now generate up to 25,000 words. So that's a, an entire dissertation. It can write in any style in multiple languages. It can be given a direct instruction, such as explain string theory in 200 words for an 11 year old child. It can interpret text and images. So on the right hand side of my slide, you can see uh, a uh, exam question in French, uh, although the prompt is in English, with an illustration. And it can interpret not only the text, but also the illustration to answer that question. It's a general purpose language tool. And even more recently, uh, there have been extensions to GPT, uh, chat GPT plus, and that has plugins for, uh, from third party companies for maths, for science, for language, business tools. For example, the Wolfram um, uh, mathematics uh, engine can now be linked into chat GPT. And importantly, it now has integration with a web browser, so you can ask it for up-to-date information. And yesterday I asked it which tech companies are likely to perform well in the near future. It went off and browsed sites relative to related to my question and synthesized the results and gave links to those sites that it had found. So it's up-to-date information and it has a code interpreter to run and display Python programs. And that may sound a bit geeky, but what it means is it can create pictures, it can create visualizations. For example, it can analyze a, a large database and show initial visualizations of that data. So it's a pretty powerful, not just language tool now, but connected into database uh, and other tools. But as we've all heard, generative AI hallucinates. It doesn't know that it shouldn't, for example, invent research studies. It has no internal explicit model of how the world works. It has um, emergent properties. It acts as if it can do maths, for example. It acts as if it has a, a model of the mind, but it has no explicit inspectable model of the world. And in human terms, it's amoral. Uh, it is neither, in a deep sense, it's neither careful nor caring. It's a language machine, not a database or a reasoning system. Now, um, over the last few months, I've tried uh, a test with it. I asked it to write a student essay. And the way that you prompt it is important. So my prompt, you're a student on a Master of Education course, write a high quality 500 word essay on a critique of learning styles. The essay should include academic references and evidence from research studies. It should begin, the construct of learning styles is problematic because. And I gave um, that prompt and it produced a response. Um, in November, 2022, when ChatGPT first came out, that was the first response it produced. So it looks like an academic uh, student essay. It has references, uh, it has a reference to research studies. And most of it is accurate, but right in the middle of it, there is a sentence there. Um, and that sentence referencing a research study is entirely invented. And it also, to back that up, produces an entirely fake academic paper. Why does it do that? because it's a language system, it's a language generator, not a database. However, when I gave the same prompt to GPT-4 in March 2023, it was much better. It produced a set of references, all of them accurate, all of them correct, and a, an essay that I would have been happy that a student submitted. So the one thing I do want to emphasize, if people say GPT can't do this, you need to ask them which version of GPT, because GPT-4 is a great deal more effective now than GPT-3 or 3.5. So how should institutions react? They could ban um, these models, but the problem is that will open up a new digital divide between confident students who will continue to use AI and will challenge 
decisions based on uh, attempts to detect whether they um, are using AI tools or not. And less confident students will be turned off using any sort of AI assistance, such as machine translation or style checkers. You could evade it, but invigilated exams are costly and limited. And asking students to state when they use AI will become increasingly difficult because these tools will be embedded into general office tools such as Microsoft Office. We could adapt, but that requires new methods of assessment, new policies and guidelines. And certainly in the UK and I think across Europe, uh, now institutions are looking to adapt rather than to ban or evade. And of course you could embrace, as for example, the country Singapore has done, uh, you could embrace AI, but that involves a long process of building trust. But for the, for the last few minutes, I want to try and flip the narrative away from how will AI impact education towards what are new and effective ways to teach and learn with AI. I'm just giving you a few examples. So these are possible, these are example roles for generative AI. One is as a possibility engine. So the educator or the student uses AI to try and answer a an open question by generating multiple responses to that question. And then the student individually or in groups synthesizes and critiques the AI responses to produce their own written answer. Another role for uh, generative AI is as a Socratic opponent in an individual or a group activity, students engage in a dialogue with uh, chat GPT or another language model, and then each student writes a, an essay based on that discussion or argumentation. Another one is as a personal tutor, where students have a tutorial assistant for any topic. And uh, uh, AI, one of the great goals of AI has been to create a intelligent tutoring system. We now have a tutoring system that can tutor on any topic. And as uh, an example, I asked it to tutor me in quantum computing and it did a good job. Uh, it firstly tested my current understanding and then it took me through a tutorial discussion. It also, if I asked it to go into further detail, it did. Uh, and also it took up an analogy that I used. So it doesn't just go through a preset sequence of tutoring. And then I asked it at the end to uh, summarize my current knowledge, my current understanding. So it also can act as a dynamic assessor. That's a very quick whip through the possibilities for new roles for generative AI in education. Uh, and here are a few more of them as a study buddy, as a motivator, um, as an exploratorium, as a co-designer. But I want to say that we should use generative AI with care. As I said earlier on, generative AI is fundamentally careless and uncaring. And we need, as educators, to add that care in terms of how we deploy it. We need to rethink written assessment. We need to still be aware of AI for factual writing and to uh, check and evaluate its output. We need to explore AI as a tool for creativity, argumentation and research. We desperately need to develop a new AI literacy and to introduce and negotiate guidelines and policy for students and staff. And just to finish off, um, what comes next? So there's a lot of obviously publicity about ChatGPT and GPT-4. They are not the only language models. Uh, and there are some very interesting uh, and uh, quite uh, exciting possibilities coming along. So there's Microsoft Copilot, which means that generative AI will be integrated into the office suite. So it's moving from a model to part of a tool set. Google Bard, so Google now has responded to ChatGPT with its own language model called Google Bard. 
that has been trained in a, in a bit of a different way. It's been given pre-training on how to respond appropriately and ethically. It's multimedia, uh, it's uh, multiple language, and it has topic specific tuning for business, for medicine. But also worth mentioning are some of the more ethical based uh, language models. So there's Claude from a startup company called Anthropic that has been trained explicitly on what it calls constitutional AI. It's trained on specific ethical principles to be helpful, honest and harmless. And Bloom, which is an open science, open access language model um, that has been uh, trained on uh, a supercomputer in France. Uh, and there's an opportunity, I think, for European institutions to get involved in training these new open models and also in fine tuning them towards specific topics and in determining responsible, ethical, effective deployment in digital education. And the last one I might mention is what's called hybrid models. So it's combining the um, neural network type models along with symbolic AI so that you can set high level goals. Uh, for instance, design me a course on this topic and it will go away and create plans, it will create tasks, it will call in the right tools, for instance, for web design, and it has a long-term memory. So it's uh, putting together generative uh, neural network AI with symbolic AI, and it's likely to be very powerful. Um, so there are a lot of issues and problems with these models, but also now a growing diversity of them and an opportunity to explore how they might be used in different sectors of digital education. And just to finish a few resources, um, I would mention the book from Rafael Perez Perez, myself called Story Machines, How Computers Have Become Creative Writers, which goes into the background and the history of uh, language generators. And a report that I would recommend very much is the UNESCO uh, Chat GPT and Artificial Intelligence in Higher Education Quick Start Guide. And it does what it says on the cover. It's a quick start guide for educators in uh, higher education. That's all I can get through in 10 minutes. And I hope it's been useful and will prompt a, a discussion over the next few minutes. Thank you so much. Mike, even we go a little bit further, we have a panel, so I want, want to ask the panel members to go up front. Uh, I will introduce you in a second. Mike, uh, in general, as the EFU board uh, for innovations and respond and critique, we use Mark Brown uh, as a, a sort of advanced organizer, but I can see now that ChatGPT will uh, put Mark Brown out of business. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I'm these are serious times. Yeah, but these are serious times. Uh, and also, you know, I would still emphasize that ChatGPT is only one of many different sorts of language models, uh, some of which are, you know, will be powerful in different ways. And I hope they will empower us rather than replace us. But that's um, to be discussed. Yeah, thank you. So, so uh, the, the panel is uh, uh, front now, and uh, I'm going to introduce Henrietta Carbonell from the Uni uh, in Swiss, uh, Achilles uh, Kameas from the Hellenic Open University, and Roland Lampke from the European University Bank in the Netherlands. Um, I want to ask you just uh, for a quick answer, a quick response uh, uh, on, on this, but you are going to moderate the session. So go ahead. <laughs> you can also take me. Yeah. Oh, that's Henrietta. Okay, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Theo, for uh, okay. this is Anna Granacci. <coughs> nice to meet you uh, online, Mike. Um, I'm from DDU and I'm uh, moderating this session. And I want to come back on your uh, presentation, actually. You said uh, that we need to embrace the AI in education and ask ourselves what are um, new and effective ways to teach uh, uh, and learn with AI. And I would like to start with this, keep uh, with this. Uh, the, panel session, maybe you could uh, 
uh, start the mic, this uh, is more continuous. And then uh, I have some questions also from uh, the panelists that have been introduced. Um, so would you, uh, yeah, um, reflect on this? Maybe? So new and effective ways to teach and learn with AI. I think we really need to start from good pedagogy. Uh, up till now, most of the discussion has been about the new technology. If we start from effective pedagogy, what are effective ways to teach, learn and assess? Uh, we have um, 30 or 40 years now of the science of learning. We know that rapid feedback, we know that collaborative learning, we know that project based learning and problem based learning are effective ways of teaching and learning. How can we then design uh, these new systems and fine tune these new systems to support that sort of learning? And I think it's an opportunity for those of us who come from a digital education background to try and lead that discussion about effective ways of teaching and learning and not just leave it up to the technologists to propose what type of technology is going to be put into schools and universities. That's very true, uh, but I want to reflect more on the data part. So it's true, it's not all about um, the HR. Uh, there are different perspectives in here. There is the teacher perspective, what they need to learn. And uh, we heard about uh, the digital skill, the student, what they need to learn. But um, I know Roland Clement has a very technical background and uh, does a lot of work with, in the Open University with uh, stuff related to artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, multimodal data. So what is your perspective in this and how can our higher educational institution deal with it? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think one, one of the big problems that we have with the um, systems that are set out right now that are put in, into place like ChatGPT and like Google Bard and something is they are owned by commercial companies and they are closed. So we as educators, we need systems that we can rely on when we want to educate with them. And that means we need to have a say in how these systems are designed and how, what kind of data they use, what kind of data they produce and how they are, they are put together. And with those commercial systems, we don't have that. Yeah? Only the experts at OpenAI, a company, know how ChatGPT is, um, is designed what kind of training data they used, how big the model is, and what technology they use. So on the one hand, I see a big, um, a big requirement towards <laughs> regulation. That is things that are already happening right now in the EU. How do we use the systems in AI? But on the other side, I also see that we as researchers and educators need to gain our own yeah, power in, in the use of these systems in terms of collaborating on um, open source systems, open access systems. And Mike has mentioned a few examples of, of these like Bloom and um, uh, Claude as, as models that are emerging, uh, that are also emerging partly from within Europe. There are further systems down the line that, that do this. And with these, we can have a strong, um, a strong position as European researchers also, or as researchers in general, on how these systems will be designed and how the, uh, how they use the right data to uh, that we need to to make them usable in within educational contexts and within <laughs> research. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, Ronald. So, but data with a learning, uh, larger learn, learn, oh, sorry, with a larger learning model means language model means uh, pretty much text. So uh, we have a text, the Mark also have uh, shown that. So this goes directly to the usage and um, the reliability uh, accuracy of this text. So this text is pretty much used by uh, students and I'm looking at Arietta and maybe could enlighten us more on uh, this aspect of reliability of the text and literacy of uh, students. What is your perspective? It's where the, the yeah. 
Well, yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. I think it's a, an important one. That's the question you've just brought up of what, knowing what's in there. And um, as a educator, we need uh, the question of accuracy is particularly important, I feel. But this is um, the system, as Mike mentioned, is improving. We, we get to, it's getting more and more reliable. But can a large language model, and I'm really talking about large language models and not large language models and something else, large language models guess the next word. Um, should they be used in education to, uh, um, as tutors, as in the, it's the role of the teacher, as a language model helping with writing, helping with choice of words, correcting writing, translating, although translation is perhaps not right. The correct word but all these things it's very it's very good at it writes very well but should we be using something that is just guessing the next word to help um our students learn they we said it's not accurate it's also not looking for the truth whereas as a professor we're looking for the truth we're trying to work out what uh what is real what is um uh what is our understanding of the world uh, which the model is definitely not doing. It has no understanding of the world and it's not looking for that <clears throat> at all. It's not the objective of the model. Um, it's also uh, biased by the data. As you mentioned, we don't know what data went into it, but it was definitely wasn't unbiased data. Um, so we're, we've fed it biased data. Biases are coming out. It's our biases, it's true, but as uh, university professors, is that what we want to share with our students? Um, what else? So, so, so there's a lot of elements. Uh, it chooses a word based on probabilities. It doesn't choose the word based on accuracy. So the, when I don't know how you work when you write, but it takes me hours to find exactly the word, right word. ChatGPT can help me find the right word, but I need to choose amongst different ones. And very often it's not the one that comes up first. Um, but, so all this means that it's um, questionable whether we should be using it as I, I, in my opinion and in my understanding now it might be possible to do other models it might be possible to make it 100% correct I know professors aren't 100% correct but we're trying to get there <coughs> chat GPT isn't even trying so with even with all these elements I think it's we need to think about how we want to use it very carefully whether we want to use it um, to as a tutor or do we want to use it as other things? And we need this discussion because our students, at least we, did, we carried out a survey uh, in our university and our students uh, responded that the first use, the current first use of ChatGPT for them is asking, getting answers to questions. So that's how they're using it at the moment. Um, they don't trust it completely, but um, that's how they use it. And if they don't know about the topic, what can they do? It's different if they're reviewing and questions like that. Thank you, Arietta. I think it might be that uh, also connecting with uh, what Roland said before, maybe we can teach the machine to learn more ethical approaches. I mean, uh, we have seen what also Mike uh, said before, that, the, that LLM is improving. So we might be able, I'm not a technical person at all, but. I suppose um, it's possible technically to teach this to the machine to be more accurate. We have seen it is accurate with the uh, resources. Maybe it could uh, learn more on uh, the ethical, but I'm more concerned about uh, the students and the teacher. And uh, I would like to hear again from Marietta, sorry, that this first I uh, feel as if you see me, but uh, more um, I was uh, wondering on the skills that actually students will need to learn. One of those is like uh, being able to understand that the LLM is not accurate. So you are reading something, not because the uh, chat GPT is giving back to you is real. So what is that? And we heard from uh, uh, Mike um, also prompting, be able to put the right question is probably something they have to learn. But what else needs to be taught to them? Um, I'll use uh, Mahara. Ma, sorry, I'll use Maha Bali's um, sentence. It's that she that she talks about critical AI skills, and I think we 
they really need to be critical in lots of dimensions, critical in um, what comes out of uh, the, the output generated by large language models, critical uh, in a more interdisciplinary context, as, um, as uh, Mike uh, was mentioning, it really it touches on a lot of different aspects of um, society, economics, philosophy, uh, the epistemology, what is knowledge, uh, yeah. questions like that. So we need to be, um, they need to be critical uh, in what it, what AI is doing to society, and what do we want it to do, and what do we not want it to do, and uh, <laughs> critical in pedagog uh, critical pedagogy sense that what is it doing to equality injustice? Is it recreating? Is it creating new injustices? Solving old ones? Uh, developing them? Just repeating them very often. So all these aspects, I think it's important for our students to learn to take a critical approach. It should be AI rather than large language models, because as we've mentioned before, it's always it's <clears throat> sorry, changing fast. We need to prepare them for a changing world. They need to be able to think on their own uh, in the future. And um, yeah, I think and then for guidance, probably from teachers, yeah. for instance. And also the last point is literacy. <clears throat> it should be not only learning how to use AI, it's pretty easy. You type a question and you've got it. Prompting is very important as it has already been mentioned, but also an understanding that you have to understand how the model works. That's super difficult because most of us don't have the AI skills. Um, it's hidden. A lot of the information is hidden. I was looking at auto GPT, trying to find information uh, about it. Uh, there's very little information out there. Um, so there's all that problem, but we need to know because a lot of people are saying that ChatGPT can do things that it just it can't do, yeah. at least on its own. And so we need to, to teach students that they need to understand what it can do to use it, to know when to use it, why to use it, how to use it, and when not to use it. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And this uh, um, brings me to the other side of the point that is uh, teachers, and I'm uh, looking at the um, Achilles uh, Kameas and uh, uh, at the Lenin University, I know you are doing a lot of uh, work also on policy level, institutional level, strategy. And um, I was wondering if you have a view on what are the soft and hard skills that uh, teachers will need to improve despite they, they are not the, the only one that needs to learn about it, but how them can improve their skill, digital skill to embed artificial intelligence in their educational practice. Yes, uh, thank you, Alessandra. Uh, well, um, I, I, I will start from uh, Mike's presentation and this very nice slide with the four uh, stages like BAN, uh, adopt, embrace, and so on. Uh, I think BAN is not the, the way to go, as also Mike said, uh, uh, banning uh, the use of the new technology. We tried this in the past at University of Actually, it's not only that students will go around it, but I mean, uh, an institution that bans the use of any new technology loses the opportunity, misses the opportunity to learn from this technology and learn how this technology can be contextualized in the specific context of the university of the university of the institute. And then also I think that uh, it's a it's rather selfish to ban the use of technology and wait for others to take the risk, others to let's say uh, make all the mistakes and then you will just uh, you just profit for the mistakes. I think we should be all together in in, in this uh, and it's uh, well we should all try to learn together so that's some comments at the policy level uh, going now to the uh, teachers and educators um, and had already said that i do agree that uh, uh, well and also mike spoke about trust but trust has two two sides okay it's we trust the system but we have also trust ourselves that we can use the system in, in a proper way, in an efficient way, in a, I don't know, fair way. So um, in order to build this trust, I think that, uh, well, now in the, let's say, hard skills of, of educators, we must add some AI basics. 
as we had to learn about I don't know online systems, uh, digital systems, and all of these uh, skills became let's say basic skills for AI for for tutors, for teachers, for educators. Now basics of AI will also uh, join this uh, be added to this group. Um, then uh, we need to see how uh, these uh, the pedagogies we the, the pedagogical techniques we already know uh, project based learning, collaborative learning. Uh, and other techniques, how will they change when this new technology will be introduced? And this will take some time. So I think that the first stage in all of this process is to experiment and learn and monitor and evaluate, collect enough data to see uh, what we can do. At the same time, technology, of course, will this technology will evolve. So we need also to monitor the evolution of technology. I, I estimate that we're going to have a we are looking into a period of some years where technology will evolve, we will be training it, and then at some point there will be an equilibrium and we will feel it safe. And then uh, the soft skills, I, well, uh, I think that we need to invest a lot in uh, collaboration to try to solve this, uh, to deal with this issue uh, all together collaboratively. Also, uh, taking the initiative to change the ways we deliver education and uh, assessment also. Uh, I'm planning to do this in the next uh, couple of years. I'm planning to ask my students to deliberately use ChatGPT and see uh, how they come, how they deal with it, and also myself learn from, from, their, uh, from their ways. Uh, Many thanks. I am uh, now uh, I would like to involve the audience because I see some people are taking notes, some others are uh, looking at their computer, so um, I might uh, require some attention a second. If we have uh, 10 minutes, so then we take a coffee. Um, I was wondering, just uh, random, who of you would uh, really feel threatened by the use of artificial intelligence uh, in the, their own institution? Yeah, if there is no right or wrong. Yeah, who feels uh, to say why? We are in panic, we're panicking uh, at the moment. Okay. In the, all, all, all Dutch universities are really panicking, examination boards, they really don't know how to deal with classical, traditional, and old fashioned examination techniques. Yes. We still embrace and we still have. We don't know what new assessment techniques uh, are out there. We don't know how to deal with now uh, all these written reports and all these uh, uh, examinations from students, and uh, they are made with ChatGPT more and more. And we don't know how to, to uh, find out uh, the, the, what, what kind of way to go now. You can, because uh, so, some uh, professors say, well, we have to uh, do uh, this uh, face to face examinations again, but it's not possible because we have the number, is... number of students with hundreds in, in one module or so. We're in panic, panic. Because you cannot recognize if an essay is made up by the, the use of uh, LLM or the student. Don't. And I'm asking to the expert. I saw you a second as well. a second. I'm asking to the expert. Is there a way to recognize a generative text uh, right now? No, we are we are. <laughs> no, there isn't. <laughs> I have seen an uh, end from the back from uh, the Kudi from Elenik. Forgot the name, sorry. Thank you, and I'm also from the Elenik of University as well. Um, in replying to your question, uh, is there a... Could you turn on the mic for the audience in the is it, online? Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, there are two concerns that I have um, in response to your, your question. The first thing is that I feel that we are rather reactive rather than, than proactive. So we react to a situation which well, we don't know how to react. And um, it took us by surprise, and well, it took me by surprise, all that. Uh, well, this year and last year, I didn't know before. So, yes, I do feel a little bit better because you know, I have to react to a situation which is developing and evolving, and I'm not part of it. I, I, I don't, in a way, uh, I cannot, well, not control, but, you know, I follow it. That's one thing. And the other thing, I think it's even more important for me, we heard before that um, they are, is amoral. 
it may be the case that it could become immoral. So yeah. if um, particular sources of information are not there, they are excluded. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from the humanities, so we understand that for sure. If there are certain sources of information that are not there, then they are excluded. That's not amoral, it's immoral. So how do we deal with all that? So these are my basic you know, concerns. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, Fernando and uh, Ada. Ada first is no, no, first. Fernando. Fernando was first. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, in my institution here in Spain, um, there is a sense of threat as well. Because using it properly, uh, might it might entail a change in the whole system, which is something that is a little frightening. <laughs> right? And also, it, there's also the, the feeling, the sense that students are way ahead of us. I mean, using them. And yeah. we are uh, training, uh, training the hard. And uh, well, that's not the, the feeling you want to have as a, as a teacher. Okay. Then, if, that's my comment. And then a, a, a question. I, I, I have seen before that it was suggested as um, one of the possible uses of AI. To, for example, make the students produce a, a text and then uh, comment on the text, criticize the text, and so on. But is that secondary exercise? Can the secondary exercise be done also by the AI? By the AI artificial intelligence? Is it Expert. capable of making a text produced by another chat, GPT, and then, well, criticizing it? From a gut feeling, that to really imply that the AI could be critical, so I, I don't think so. But uh, I leave the floor to the expert. Uh, yes, certainly that is possible. You, if you can, if you can let the AI summarize um, yes. something and take a critical point or different point of view, you can also ask it to critically reflect on these three critical different points of view and summarize them again. So that's that's yeah. fully possible yeah. with the current versions of, yeah, of that GPT yeah. <laughs> I was wrong, but I saw that there was other people <coughs> wanted to talk. It was mm -hmm. Ada Pastora? Ada, please. Um, El Tato. <coughs> Mike, I think you are completely right that this is the end of the traditional assessment methods. We just yeah. have to take that serious. And this is a crisis because we haven't wanted to tackle with that question for years. <laughs> so now it's one more hit on this neural neurologic point. But I want also to stress the positive sides. You, you said about tutoring and dynamic assessors. Although I heard your critiques, maybe that's not the best tutor, but we all know we need more tutoring in large scales, we need more feedback mechanism. And my biggest hope with these systems is that maybe this is a way to do that with large cohorts. I mean, this one-to-one -one situation is a good one, and but we can't do it without machines. So could you, uh, could you uh, underline that maybe the light at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> Okay, um, so I think there are many opportunities, particularly for um, personal tutoring, and that the students themselves are going to be you know, taking a lead in this. Uh, they just as they go to Wikipedia or they go to Google search um, to find information to get up to date to explore a new topic, they will be doing this in the future with language models. There will be problems um, with the responses. They will not always be accurate um, in the same way that Wikipedia in the early days wasn't accurate. And there was a lot of criticism about um, uh, encyclopedia that weren't human cu curated. But I, th I think as they start to improve and particularly as they start to have back end tools like um, maths tools, science tools, they will become more hybrid systems that will be better adapted towards tutoring. So we, uh, as I said before, we need to treat them with care and we need to develop an AI literacy in which students 
treat them with care. Um, they um, make sure that any evidence, uh, any information that comes from these systems are checked, checked against accurate sources. And that's part of a new AI literacy. But you know, I just want to end by saying that we can't sit back. Uh, particularly, we can't sit back and just let the, you know, the US corporations take a running in this. Uh, we have an opportunity to get involved in more ethical and more open language models and also in adapting them to education. That's our, that's our expertise in what is good and effective education. And we have a voice in this. And I really don't want to just let the American technologists take a lead. Um, we in Europe and as educationalists, we need to take a lead in saying what is effective and ethical education. And that's the kind of message I would want to leave on. It's really nice. Let's be positive and not panicking and active and analyzing. And on this note, I have just the last question. And then we have the coffee from Pastora. This is where is yours. Okay, thank you. And it's more common than a question, but thank you very much. Oh, now? Now you can hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you very much for this panel. I will say it's more common than a question because I think this proactive way of dealing and talking with this panic attack we have right, <laughs> right now is the way to, to address it. And, and at my institution, the Open University of Catalonia, we just started a structuring um, internal debate in order to bring all the professors together in order to learn, because we, we should start learning ourselves how to deal with that, how to understand it, how to make it more ethical and more, uh, yeah, everything that Dylan was mentioning, we are trying to do it at an institutional level. So why not also at the network level? We are here, many of the open universities in Europe trying to learn all together how to improve all these methods and how to avoid all these challenges and try to yeah. Yeah, make them better. Yeah. Yeah. And, so it uh, seems a, a, a call to a dialogue, which is always nice, maybe a Socratic one with ChatGPT, who knows? Uh, uh, so uh, I think it's time for coffee. Thank you, Mark, Mark uh, Mike, sorry, today. Roland and uh, it makes it exciting though, there's a nice discussion, isn't it? An interesting time to be there. Nice shoes. <laughs> Was nice, yeah. 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 Yeah.
completely different now. <laughs> Forget about ChatGPT for the moment. <laughs> for the for the introduction and the, for the invitation um, I always say that it's impossible to get to a higher education conference these days without talking about micro credentials <laughs> regardless of what the theme of the conference is and I know uh, I, I've heard it mentioned at least twice this morning already so so here we go um, indeed my name is Anna Gober I'm the director of ENCA for anybody that uh, that is not aware um, ENCA is the representative organization of quality assurance agencies in the European higher education area. Our members, we have um, 56 of them, and in order to be a member of ENCA, you have to demonstrate that your agency is working in compliance with the ESG, the Standards and Guidelines for Quality Assurance in the European Higher Education Area, ESG for short, it's the full title, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, we've been doing, of course, some work on micro-credentials, haven't everybody? Uh, and the basis for that work, um, and, and that I draw on that for today's presentation, we have a, a working group that's been exploring um, what the role of uh, quality assurance agencies is uh, in terms of micro-credentials and the applicability of the ESG, um, both uh, for internal and external quality assurance. And we're also part of the uh, I'm in QA project, which has um, also a specific strand of work on micro-credentials, quality assurance of micro-credentials, um, and, um, and we've been leading the work on that. Uh, short disclaimer, um, most of the work on micro-credentials is covered by another member of my team. Um, she went on maternity leave two weeks ago, so uh, I'm, I'm picking up that, that portfolio. Um, and uh, But just uh, due credit to uh, Eleanor Searlin, because she's done uh, the, the bulk of the, the research on, on which I base uh, today's uh, presentation. So what's our starting point? Um, I, Whenever I talk about micro-credentials, I always start with um, you know, highlighting the fact that micro-credentials are really not new. They've been around for a long time. It's just that they have gained prominence because of the, you know, the, the policy focus on micro-credentials uh, in terms of their role on in upskilling and reskilling um, the, the, the labour force. And we also have some new te terminology in, in which to, to talk about them. So, you know, whereas they might not have been called micro-credentials before, that's, that's the word that we generally now, now use. Um, but they have been around a, a, a long time. And uh, I think the other point to make, um, given the audience I'm speaking to today, is that uh, there's often an assumption that micro-credentials um, are, are delivered digitally, are delivered online, and that's not always the case. So a lot of what I talk about today apply to um, you know, the broad spectrum of micro-credentials, however they, or whatever mode in which uh, they are delivered. Um, but I'll say a few words at the end uh, with some specific um, points uh, in relation to digital education. There's been um, previous work on, on QA of micro-credentials done, and what that has confirmed is that the existing Bologna process tools that we have, DCTS, the ESG, um, the, the qualifications framework, um, they, they all still apply to micro-credentials, although there are some, of course, specificities that need taking into account. 
and particularly in terms of quality assurance, we still work on the, the sort of core principle that it is the provider that is responsible for the quality and the quality assurance of their provision. And that's regardless of whether it's a full degree program or it's a micro credential. And that external quality assurance should be proportionate to that. Um, there was a bit of a fear, I think, when this conversation first started that quality assurance agencies were suddenly going to be asked to externally review every single micro-credential, um, and that set panic into the hearts of anybody working into external QA, clearly not feasible and also not desirable. So we're looking at a, a, a proportional um, response in terms of external quality assurance. I was asked to talk about quality perspectives on micro-credentials. Um, I'm not really going to do that. I'm going to talk about quality assurance of micro-credentials. And you know, when I talk to people that are maybe not familiar with quality assurance, they want to know, well, what, what is quality of higher education? How do we, you know, how do you, how do you um, assess quality of higher education? Um, and unfortunately, we always have a bit of a, a cop-out answer, which is indeed that the quality is contextual. Um, so there's no one single definition of quality. And what does this mean when it comes to, to micro-credentials in the same way as it, it means for any education provision? We think about quality being defined in terms of its fitness for purpose. This leads us then to the question, well, what is the purpose of micro-credentials? If we want to know if they're their quality or not, if they're delivering on, on what they intend to, then we need to know what, what was the purpose of them. So why do higher education institutions offer micro-credentials? The, the, the points on the slide here um, were, were taken from a work published in 2015. And my colleague uh, was looking at this as part of the, the desk research for the report that she was writing. It's like, okay, 2015. And then I stopped and I was like, gosh, actually that's eight years ago already, doesn't time fly? And in the current fast paced changing environment, Eight years is actually quite a long time. I mean, we were talking just now about uh, artificial intelligence and in that regard, eight weeks seems like a long time. So looking at these, what's changed since 2015? I think all of these points are, are really still valid. Um, we might add uh, a bit more about offering flexible learning paths for, for students. We might talk a bit more about integration of different tertiary education systems, you know, crossover between vocational education and, uh, and you know, more research intensive higher, higher education. We might use some slightly different language. We might talk more about improving lifelong learning opportunities. And we might think also about um, the role that micro-credentials play in uh, institutions delivering on their, their strategy, delivering on, the, on their mission. And I think there's been a bit more focus now about how micro-credential delivery fits into the, the strategic plan of the, an institution, that it's not just a kind of ad hoc delivery done by, by some professors, by some, by some faculties. But in principle, I think everything um, uh, that was mentioned in 2015 certainly still stands. So that's why micro, uh, institutions offer micro-credentials. Why do learners take micro-credentials? What we've seen from the research is that the learners can be broadly grouped into, into two categories. One is the existing enrolled students. So those already uh, perhaps studying for a full degree program at an institution, and they might take micro-credentials because they have to, because as part of their program, they were required to take some elective modules, um, and that they can take those from wherever they like across the university. Um, obviously, this varies considerably from country to country, depending on how, how degree programs are structured. And we might also see that enrolled students take them um, simply for their, their own self-interest. It's a topic outside their study area um, that they're just personally interested in, or they might be taking it for a specific professional development opportunity, particularly if they're working alongside studying or that they're you know, looking uh, for entry into a particular career after higher education. The second group then is, is lifelong learners. Um, so they may be taking um, micro-credentials for, for professional development, upskilling or reskilling, perhaps a changing career. Um, it could be compulsory or voluntary, something that their, their employers require them, require them to take or something that they're doing for their personal development. 
We also see a group of learners that are taking micro credentials in order to access higher education. And you know, this ties into um, education strategies around broadening access to higher education, that there are different routes into higher education that, than, than we might have talked about previously. Um, and of course, we have those that are taking them just for their own personal self-interest. What it does mean is that the, the, the group that we, we call here lifelong learners are usually seen as being more diverse um, than, than enrolled students. Um, and this, of course, has quite significant implications for course design in terms of prior knowledge, uh, in terms of the teaching approach and, and, and the mode of delivery. So that's something to, to keep in mind for those that are are offering micro-credentials is who is really the target group and what are they going to be bringing with them uh, before entering the micro-credential. In terms of approaches to offering micro-credentials for, for institutions, um, again, we see kind of two, two main categories. There's the approach of unbundling existing programs, so offering modules from existing programs as a, as a standalone unit that can be taken by, by students or, or, or external learners. Um, and these are usually then developed as part of the, the institutional's usual curriculum design process, and therefore for quality assurance, they fall under the existing quality assurance procedures, both internal and external quality assurance. But I think it does require then some additional reflection on the institutional part as to how that module sits when you look at it in isolation and not as part of the broader program. And I think there's an interesting discussion to be had around the, the sort of tension between the, the, uh, the requirement and, and the wish to provide flexible learning paths for students on the one hand, and on the other hand, the kind of good principles of curriculum design. When you design a full program, you think not just about the individual modules in isolation, but what they mean in terms of the learner's journey and the accumulative skills that are built up, particularly in terms of soft skills. How are those being delivered through the different units, modules of a full degree program? And what happens when you take one of those modules in, in isolation? On the other hand, we have the standalone micro-credentials. Um, and what we've seen is for institutions, these often fall under the sort of lifelong learning provision, um, uh, which is maybe sort of a, a different segment of, of the institution's uh, strategy. These might also be, be tailor-made um, and often in partnership, either with other, uh, other institutions. Um, we see, for example, some of the university alliances, European university alliances are working on developing micro-credentials, but also in partnership with, for example, businesses in order to offer, um, and this is where the tailor-made aspect comes in, a particular uh, training opportunity for, um, uh, for, for employees. In terms of quality assurance, what we then see is that this is often covered by the quality assurance of lifelong learning provision rather than necessarily the quality assurance of, of degree programs because they don't form a, an integral part of any, any program. And often that's a slightly lighter touch. Um, in terms of internal quality assurance, um, the institutions that we spoke to as part of this research identified a number of Kind of most important criteria when it comes to, to micro-credentials in terms of um, well-defined learning outcomes, transparent assessment methods, and transparent public information. But we also saw that there's a need for particular attention to be paid in terms of internal quality assurance when the micro-credential is delivered in partnership with another organisation um, that might not have already its own, uh, um, own processes in place, or they may need to be aligned with each other. In terms of external quality assurance, um, this depends very much on the level at which external QA is conducted in the country or system in which you're, you're working. Um, if it's a programme level, um, this raises then some questions because if it's a module from a program, it falls under that. But if it's separate, you know, does it need looking at individually? If your external QA is at an institutional level, then, then usually there isn't a particular issue here. You just want to know that the institution has its own processes in place uh, for addressing micro-credentials. We've also seen a number of different approaches from quality assurance agencies. Um, there are a few, not very many, that are developing a standalone approach for micro-credentials. 
Um, some, uh, like Ireland, for example, are developing a scaled approach. So they already had an approach for um, special purpose programs and minor award programs that are you know, smaller units than a full degree program. And they scaled that down to be applicable to, to micro credentials. But what we see from most quality assurance agencies is that they take an integrated approach. So they don't define standalone criteria for micro credentials. They integrate it into their existing processes. But what they see, what agencies see as the most important challenges um, is a lack of, um, of support or, or a gap in the national legislation. Everybody's still kind of feeling their way as to where micro credentials fall within the you know, existing higher education uh, legal framework. And also a lack of clear definitions and, and common understanding. Um, you know, we're looking at the, the research that we've done, there are so many different definitions of micro-credentials. Now, there, of course, there's a lot of very common themes throughout those, but some define the number of ECTS in terms of a range, some don't. Some say they need to be aligned with the qualifications framework, some don't. Um, so there's a lack of a kind of common understanding there. As I said before, concern about the burden this potentially places on, on quality assurance agencies, but also a clear expectation that their the agencies are looking for guidance, either from national level, but also from European level. In terms of digital delivery, um, ENC has done some work in the past on, on QA of um, e-learning, of, of digital education, and now we've got our work on, on QA of micro-credentials, and there's sort of a, a meeting point where the, where the two come together. Um, but I think the issues that come up for QA of e-learning are, are, are very transferable to the digital delivery of, of micro-credentials in the sense that for institutions, they need to think carefully about the different approaches to, to learning and teaching and assessment that are, are, are better suited for the online delivery, uh, different considerations in terms of the learning resources and student support, and really importantly, the, the access and digital literacy. We heard already from, from Ivana about, um, you know, that we shouldn't be assuming that students are coming into higher education uh, fully digital literate, um, and the same with, with the teachers. So that really needs keeping in mind. And for QA agencies, what we've seen um, in recent years is because there is a blurring of boundaries between, on, between digital education and you know, traditional in-person education, there's also a move away from separating quality assurance procedures for online programs and face-to-face um, -face programs, because that line is, is just not clear anymore. So we see an integration um, of the criteria for, for digital and uh, physical um, uh, education provision. A few final reflections uh, to wrap up. Um, what we've seen is that the existing quality assurance approaches are indeed applicable, but as I've said, there are a few areas that need specific attention. But importantly, External quality assurance of micro-credentials is still needed in some form. And you know, I reiterate that that doesn't mean that every single micro-credential needs uh, externally reviewing. But external QA is the tool that we have to give confidence in the micro-credential that is awarded at the end, when we think of micro-credential as being the, the certificate and, and the award. And that has really important consequences when it comes to recognition, stackability, portability, um, uh, and further access to, to higher education. But what's really important is that we maintain a balance between regulation and flexibility. Because although quality assurance agencies are asking for, for guidance and framework and, and, and you know, filling of gaps in national legislation, as soon as you put something in law, it's really difficult to change. And we've seen how, thing, how fast things are changing. Um, so I think you know, there's a need for, for guidance, but maybe not hard regulation, um, so that uh, you know, national frameworks can keep pace with, with future change. The final thing I want to say is that, of course, micro-credentials are not unique to higher education. And I could do a whole presentation on this rather than including it as a final bullet point in the, in the final reflections. Um, but there's a lot of questions from, from institutions and quality assurance agencies is what do we do with micro-credentials offered by private providers? And I don't mean private institutions, I mean you know, businesses, companies. And I think here we have to be a little bit careful. Um, there's a little bit of a risk that the higher education sector may be seen as kind of 
preaching or encroaching on, on private sector, if we start telling companies such as Google and Microsoft that they need to quality assure their micro credentials in the same way that we do in the education sector. But I think there is a need for a dialogue with them, particularly if those companies are offering micro credentials with the express purpose that it allows people to take them into higher education institutions for access, for recognition of prior learning. Um, so I think there is a need for dialogue, but we need to be quite careful that we're not imposing our higher education approaches on, on other sectors. So with that, I wrap up. Um, and uh, it's a bit of a whirlwind to talk, but I, I hope it raised some interesting points for you. Thank you very much on that. Uh, I'm certain there are questions. <laughs> well, yeah, first of all, thank you for uh, thank you for this interesting talk. Uh, we were asked in the beginning to not forget everything about ChatGPT. Unfortunately, I couldn't. Um, I see. I see one big commonality between micro credentials and um, uh, large language models in education, and that is the purpose of tailoring education to the needs of the individual, just personalization. While I see, of course, there are completely different approaches. One is the micro credential, human driven learning design, designing these uh, aspects in the use of AI. It's like automating things. And they lead to very different problems. Yeah? In micro credentials, you probably get the scaling problem and these quality problems. In AI, we get all the problems we discussed this, this morning. But still, I would, would be interesting. Do you think that these two perspectives or these two different things also can grow together? Can we use AI also to support, for instance, the scaling issue in, in uh, micro credentials and support quality assurance to at least some extent and also use micro credentials? to better inform AI what it should teach us and overcome the hallucination problems and things like that. Well, there's a lot packed into that question. <laughs> um, I actually, when you said, you know, could we use AI to, I thought you were going to say, um, you know, use micro credentials to teach people about how to use AI. And, you know, that seems a, a kind of obvious thing. Um, uh, whether whether um, AI tools would take a micro credential, I, I'm afraid my, I, I'm not so technologically uh, uh, literate enough to, to answer that question. Um, I think, you know, the, the implications that um, AI have for um, micro credentials, it's it's the same principles that we're talking about in terms of what what they have for um, you know for higher education in in general, and the same opportunities and and challenges that come up. And you, you know you've mentioned several of them already, but I think there is a really um, good role that micro credentials can play in terms of helping people to understand how they can use AI. Um, so that that's where, where I would see a. a you know, a clear opportunity. I mean, I, I, to be honest, myself would, would take a micro credential on, on understanding uh, AI. Um, but I think there was a lot more packed into that question. I, I know that's a, a very short answer to it. Yes, Mark Brown, um, you may or may not be aware, I recently completed a study for the OECD on um, quality assurance of micro credentials, which won't be published for some time. But it's good to hear your overview. Um, and I'll ask a question rather than give you too much of a statement, but a point of clarification for Ireland, because it also had the contract with QQI. Um, Ireland has topic specific guidelines, and we have uh, out for public consultation at the moment set of guidelines for digital education that embed micro credentials mm -hmm. as part of digital education. Um, my question really links to um, your observations related to the learner. Because as part of the OECD study, the work we've done in Ireland, we really do identify that the learner isn't strong enough in the quality assurance. Mm. Um, maybe that's more generally speaking, depending on the mindset and the contemporary orientation. But an example is uh, an analysis of the quite high profile portals for micro credentials. The one launched in Ireland just very recently, none of them say anything about career guidance, career advice, they mm -hmm. have an AI um, app or a bot of some kind to steer people. That's an obvious thing. And none of them also say anything about learner support and development services. And lastly, unlike MOOC platforms <coughs> that provide a star rating and comments from learners, when you look at the course as a prospective student, 
none of these portals are that information for learners. So any observations or comments on the learners perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, good to finally see you face to face, Mark. You've been working with Karina, right? Yes. Yeah, we should have a chat afterwards. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, a lot of the issues around student centered learning, which, you know, is something that we've been talking about in higher education, um, you know, for, for 10 years or so now, um, are even come even more into focus in, in micro credentials. And, you know, when we talk about the, the ESG being applicable also to micro credentials, um, there are some aspects um, in there around student support um, and uh, around uh, information to, to the public and, and to students, um, which I, I entirely take your point is, is perhaps not strong enough, uh, strongly enough reflected in, in micro credentials. In terms of quality assurance, the challenge, of course, is that um, micro credential learners are often a learner for a very short period of time. And so, you know, the usual kind of student feedback loops that we have um, for, for example, full degree programs, it's very difficult to condense them into the short period in which they might be taking a micro credential. And you perhaps don't stay in touch with your former students in a way that an institution stays in touch with, with its alumni. Um, so I think institutions need to think very carefully about how they can engage with their students during the micro credential and very sort of short, sharp opportunities for feedback so that changes can be made in a much shorter time scale than we would see traditionally. Um, and indeed, the, the information provision is a, is a really important one, the, the transparency of, of the information provision. And uh, totally take your point that that's not strong enough at the moment. For the moment, uh, I only have one question. Uh, I'm question to we can handle now for the time being. So, Ada was the last one to. Oh, uh, oh so, I'm sorry. No, I have come to what's yeah. Just one no, question. No, I uh, otherwise, we have to. Yeah. 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 I, I, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I was. I was. Thank you very much, Ada. Um, hopefully, I'll ask a question if you wanted to ask. Uh, hi. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joe Casanova from the Open University of Portugal. But I'm also representing a project that uh, here he is also involved in a lot of, of our colleagues from here who are also involved um, in, the, in my credentials and in trying to develop policy uh, for, for my credentials. And we are um, we are doing some empirical research on different uh, my credentials that we are also offering within this consortium. We are very institutions like in my credential that we uh, look at. Um, and the findings that we are realizing, both from institutional policy and strategic decisions, but also uh, in practical terms, also the, the courses that we believe that are uh, the modules that we believe would eventually uh, lead up to my credentials, is that there is a lot of inconsistency. And this comes back again to what you were saying about guidance on both the national government and also the commission. So, from what we understand, there is also a uh, From what from what we understand, there is um, uh, not a lot of clarity, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there is some funding available. So institutions are developing their own credentials without clear guidance. Mm -hmm. They are setting up their own mechanisms, the QA mechanism. They are discussing, some of us are discussing with our own national quality assurance agencies who do not want. For now, at least, to have a say, as you rightly said, just a few uh, QA institutions, sorry, QA agencies nationally are uh, developing policy or uh, are engaged with uh, quality assurance mechanisms for all of my credentials. So, we are in a situation where we are developing all my credentials in very different formats across Europe, um, waiting for some guidance which will eventually come by the end of the year. Uh, let's see, let's hope. Um, and that will cause serious problems, both for ourselves, but also for QA agencies, uh, whether the national government decide that individual QA agencies will have to somewhat regulate uh, the quality assurance market. This is a reflection, but it's a reflection based on, on, on evidence of being engaged with, with my credentials at the moment. Um, what's your take on that? How, how do you think we'll be able, uh, in terms of trying to achieve those Big outcomes that the Commission wants with, with their regular on micro credentials. Uh, how, how are we going then to contain everything that we've been developing so far without clear guidance into one consistent approach to my credentials? Let me 
short answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, my short answer would be um, directed not at the institutions, but at the policymakers, um, that the guidance needs to be broad um, and take into account the existing diversity of micro credentials because you know you you raise this point and, and frame it almost as if it's a problem, but uh, I think we also have to see it as a, as a wonderful thing. Um, and as I said, if you over-regulate, then you lose that space for innovation um, and experimentation. And I think micro-credentials are a really good way of, for higher education institutions to do that. Um, and, and so I would really call, yeah, I fully understand that we need some kind of framework and guidance in order to support recognition and, and accessibility and all those things. But I would encourage it to be as, as broad as possible, so to encompass the, uh, the diversity um, of the existing work. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, your uh, answers to all these uh, difficult questions. You're very popular. I hope you can join us uh, with the <laughs> network lunch uh, afterwards because people uh, have more questions. But for now, thank you very much. And yeah, maybe. <laughs> We go to our last uh, speaker, uh, last key, the keynote for today, inclusion and digital accessibility. And it comes from Ada Pellet, the uh, president uh, uh, of the Fellowship, the director of the Fellowship and vice president of EFU. Ada, what's yours? That's why I step back because I have now the opportunity to talk. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, so another, um, I think for all us important topic, in a way we were all founded because um, it was said that we are more inclusive than the then traditional universities. So that's in our DNA, I would say, to be more inclusive, oh, sorry, to be more inclusive and from the beginning on, I think all the open universities had to think, how can we fulfill this mission? We have to bring the learning to the learners. They can't come to us, but we have to reverse the process and bring the learning wherever they are. That was one of the founding ideas of many of our institutions. And of course, media changed how we did it. So a lot of us still have study booklet because that was way of sending a written seminar to them. Now we have so much more media possibilities. It became more social media, much more on collaboration. But we know if we want to keep this mission of to be inclusive, we have also to look at digital accessibility. As we heard before in the algorithms, there is a lot of bias. There's a lot of presumptions and it's maybe hidden. So we have to bring it up and say, okay, what kind of picture of the student is incorporated there? So this should uh, mean is of central importance. I didn't invent a new word with intro, but I think diversity is just central for all of us. I still think we are the most diverse institutions in whole um, Europe, although, the others have opened up. So we nowadays say higher education is much bigger. And of course, the student body is much more diverse at the other side also. So they get more interested. And um, I think one teaching in a way that reflects that diversity is not only our mission, but has become the goal of higher education since people are so diverse. Let's um, take um, in didactics, which are the um, diversity related challenges. You have self perception that's very diverse. So there are um, a lot of diverse dimensions come into. It's also our perception of this diversity. How many uh, dimensions of diversity do we see? What is the subject content? How diverse is that? What about communication and interaction? What about our teaching and learning methods? 
performance reviews. Yeah, we will have this was completely inspiring for me, the session on um, before also the last one, because I think in a way it's all interconnected. If we want to address a diverse student body, we, we have to acknowledge, yes, they are different. And what can we do? You said already personalized. We all know that personalizing is improving learning because then in the end, everyone, it's not only about categories of um, students or dimensions of diversity. In the end, it's individualization and personalization. If you really want to tackle with diversity because we are all different. And um, I think our big hope, at least mine, uh, is that new machine-based learning can help us to tackle with that in a way that really makes personalization feasible, manageable. So, and I want uh, very much to underline what Mark uh, said about this consultancy guidance and so on. So if we don't take that serious, we never will be able to personalize. So that's the, the second side of the medal. And there's big hope that the new techniques will help us in that because of, in, in the end, I think the old model, uh, one teacher, one tutor is not as bad, but it can't be persons. So we, we have now with these big um, technological possibilities, maybe the chance to reinforce this very old model of good learning. And um, so I think diversity is not a new phenomenon that is merely manifesting through demographic characteristics. It's much more. And you see, it arises from miscellaneous prior knowledge. Yeah, they all come with a different mindset and competence view. Cultural conditioning. We are here in a very um, European international environment. We have all different cultural backgrounds which is a, a big resource if we work with those. Linguistic competencies are, are different uh, also in the own language. I'm coming from Austria in Germany. They would deny that I'm talking German. So we all have different approaches. Uh, we have self-learning competences at very different degrees. So we all know we should prepare the learner how to learn, but is that really happening? Self-assessment, yeah, of course, uh, the, all the assessment issues and um, the availability, where are they? You, our students are very busy in different kinds of worlds, so how do we get them? And I think um, now I come to digitalization, of course, is a big chance. If, if we bear in mind with every new technology you have to assess, what kind of picture of the student is now incorporated and how can all these technology, uh, technological possibilities help me to fulfill my mission of diversity? Because I think diversity is the mission and digitalization is the technique. Yeah, it helps me to fulfill that in a much better way, even for large uh, scale, in large scale. So, um, what do we have to do? I think um, we were just talking about curricula. Anna, where is she? Um, she that. I, it came to my mind that you said, if we free the module from the curriculum, we have to think, what's the context of that? So in a way, we transfer this task to the learner and say, here you have a menu of micro, credential make a sense out of it. The curriculum was a way to build a coherent structure. If we now say for various reasons, we take the modules, then we need, as Mark pointed out, much more consultancy and uh, support, also recommendation systems, that this menu makes a sense for the individual learner. So how can the individual learner find out which kind of micro-credentials do I, knew, know, uh, do I need 
what are my competencies now, which are the competencies I want to have. And then I think we are right in the middle of all the critical questions of quality assurance in higher education in a nutshell, because we suddenly have to say, um, who is looking at that? So I'm very much uh, fond of um, auditing quality management systems of institution, not diving into, uh, into uh, micro-credentials themselves, but having a system. And then as an institution who says diversity is important, I have to think, okay, if that is my mission, how do micro-credential help me to fulfill this mission? And how do online digitalized micro-credentials help me to fulfill that mission? So in um, that sense, it, makes, it means a lot for e-learning, but we also have to do a lot of research on that. I mean, we were talking about, we, we still don't know. We are at the beginning of something. And uh, if we, um, I think we should much more make use of the power of the student body. We said that already with ChatGPT. I mean, we have to use them. If we train the students in using that, it's so much more. And, and I think if we use them in quality assurance, that's about giving feedback. So then the external quality assurance would have to look, how do you involve the students in that? How do you involve them in the creation, in the quality assurance? How is the feedback loop? And if we are talking about certain groups, why don't we involve them? <coughs> For instance, people with some disabled capabilities, they know. So we will never find out if we don't see education as a two-way side of communication. And then these things nicely come together with the things we talked about, because I think if the teachers more stress their duty on finding the right way to assess, I think that's the big thing we should learn out of GPT, that we don't owe um, spend most of the time in creating content, but the real scholarship is thinking about good ways of assessing. That's the core duty of teachers in, in my world, I think would be in the future. And then the students should be in, involved in, in those processes and university management. I mean, we have somehow, we gather here as a, a from the perspective of management, so I was thinking since yesterday evening, how can I bring this into my institution, knowing that teachers do not like to talk about examination, um, that it's really not easy to make feedback loops with students who are busy and employed and have thousand lives to live. So we always think, how can we really involve that? And with quality assurance, I'm, I'm um, very fond of one of your last sentences, that you said, be careful about regulation. A living in Germany, I say, yes. Can we underline that? I'm in an environment that's so fond of regulation. And if we do that in higher education now on the micro-credential or chat GPT level, oh gosh, let's, let's make this institution strong. Yeah, in the institutional approach of diversity is the mission, quality assurance is a means and also digitalization is something we all have to, I think we all have to make them capable of, that's our educational task. But in the institution, it's a supportive task because we can reach this goal of diversity in a much better way. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ada, for bringing it all together, wrapping it up. Uh, and you need an Austrian, uh, that is a fund of uh, a fund of uh, regulations <laughs> not to, to criticize it also so <laughs> um everything comes together um i think maybe if there's one question for ada at the moment and i would ask the panel members already to come up uh, from the, uh, the stage so, so go ahead yeah. i have a question about um 
you mentioned how diverse our students are, and that's very important. And I think that brings a lot of in, enriches the experience of our students, but it also enriches our universities' knowledge uh, much better when there's, when there's a diversity of uh, points of view. Um, but then you mentioned uh, in personalization and individualization of education. But students learn from each other um, in the diversity, the, the, the diversity and um, we want to, knowledge is fundamentally socially uh, founded. And how, how do you balance these two sides between individualization, but the need for the academic discourse interactions? Um, mm -hmm. This works. Yes, you're perfectly right. And I think we, we should try not to make a opposition of these tools because um, individualization, personalization makes a, a, a underlines. I, I take the individual serious and try to create a really enhancing personal learning environment for the individual. That's one important issue. But of course, we are not only individuals, but we are a society uh, network together via collaboration. So I think the second pillar of all our institutions is how do we enhance collaboration? How do we train them in collaborating, also in hybrid ways? That's very important competence goal. And then I think when this is done, these two pillars, we can meet like here in presence, but the other things have to be of high quality. And then there can happen only the things that can happen in this kind of setting. That's my personal vision because then you have the best quality of all words. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so probably the, the members forgot that, that, that they are in the panel, but I identified <laughs> Adam Adler, Gloria uh, 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 Vice President of the European Student Union, uh, Diogo Casanova, Vice Director for Innovation and Quality at the Universidad uh, Aberta, Petros uh, Pasha. <laughs> Bashadis, uh, Rector of the University of Cyprus, to uh, come on stage and um, have a nice discussion. What? There is one chair in the seat. Yes, a chair. Okay. We can have this one. Ah, okay. Yeah. 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 Hi. Okay. Uh, a concluding a panel is always difficult uh, because uh, we heard so many things today and I think uh, tomorrow, uh, this morning, it was very inspiring and uh, in general, I want to start with a, a general broad discussion that I think brought us back to, uh, to the different topics. So I want to hear from you, how do you see all this change, digital transformation, higher education and training, uh, challenges and opportunities? And how do you um, deal with, with all these uh, new things, this insecurity and uh, uh, challenges? Um, on the general a board level, a university level, so on a policy level, uh, also as a student union. So uh, how do you cope with all these changes? Because these are really exciting, but also difficult times. So uh, I would start uh, with you first. Uh, so from a student perspective. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't know, do you hear me well? Sure. Yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. Firstly, to just briefly present myself. I'm Oya Onita. I'm Vice President of ESU, European Students Union, the organization which represents students at European level, uh, composed of uh, 45 <coughs> national union of students from 40 countries. And indeed, uh, we I, I have seen amazing presentations and it, it is a truly revolution in education and in higher education. It is all about reaping the benefits. And I would also start uh, in, in order of uh, the least disrupting in a way to the most disrupting as, as I would see it. So uh, discussing first about digitalization and micro credentials and then artificial intelligence as a, as a more specific uh, topic. And I believe, and you of course know it, it was very important at the beginning to point out in, in the presentation regarding the digitalization that the narrative of promoting digitalization through the pandemic is in a way wrong because we didn't have digitalization, digital education, that we had normal education through digital means because of the emergency context. 
And uh, in, in many cases, we've seen it discussing with our student unions, we have cases in which universities say, okay, we have implemented digital education. We are digitalized. Why? Because we bought a Zoom link and we are doing our classes through Zoom. So it was actually a, a difficult, uh, a difficult uh, um, attempt to try to understand and to shape this narrative that having digital education is not, is not only that. And also having a lot of digital content right now around us, of course, the method of, of uh, ensuring the quality arises and also the method of inclusion. And we heard a very important presentation. This is of course very important for us. And yet at the beginning, we thought that digital education is a panacea. It's a solution for, for everything. And even for, or especially for accessibility. But uh, looking at the data we have, and we had uh, even a big study in the pandemic, uh, on the impact of digitalization, we've seen that without the design, so without the proper measures, not only that digital education doesn't support accessibility, but it may even hinder it for, for groups that do not have access to, to digital, to proper actually, not digital environment, because nowadays most of us have access to digital environment, but it's a method of having access to the proper digital environment and, and digital infrastructure and tools. And actually it can even more hinder, uh, hinder the, the access to, to higher education. Then related to, to micro credentials uh, from, from the student perspective, what we see very important also discussing with, with students are three issues. Firstly, the scope, because we say that uh, micro credentials can support employability and micro credentials can support upskilling and reskilling. And discussing with students, we've seen that this can happen if you design it by, by this, and you, you cannot have all of them together. And the one risk that we see also because we discussed about inclusion is the risk of commodification. Because if you, for example, have a longer study program and you just dis uh, unbundle it to different micro credentials, which may or may not be coherent between them, after you break a longer program in, in, into smaller micro credentials, and then you, for example, create a special tax for, or a special fee for all the micro credentials, then there is this balance. Okay, we have flexibility, but do we have inclusion anymore? So we are, we are very much looking into, into this. And uh, just for the, for the introductory, introductory question, I wouldn't uh, say only some, some things about AI. We are very optimistic about this, I would say. We really want as students to engage with it. And we were very critical of, I don't know, universities like Sion's Co trying to ban. Uh, we had that very uh, um, known decision that uh, AI is banned. What, what does it mean? How can you ban? Yeah, as, as a university, actually, uh, because yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we, we need to experiment it, we need to understand it, and I, I think everyone agrees that right now we do not properly understand it as, as stakeholders. And at the end, and here maybe I would a bit disagree uh, with the previous intervention, we also need to regulate. I think the debate is not only do we want to regulate it or not, but to what degree do we regulate it? For example, now in the European Parliament, we have uh, the AI Act in which they ban uh, emotional recognition used in education through AI. Is it good? Is it not good? I mean, we, we as SU, we believe that is good. Then, of course, you have other issues in which you cannot regulate or in which you can regulate but cannot ban. And uh, that's, that's what we try to see, to understand what are, what are the added values in which dimensions and then to quality assure uh, using AI tools. But in general, we are very very optimistic about it and yeah that would be for my for my first intervention <coughs> thank you very much Diogo. Uh, yeah, uh, I was. I had a couple of uh, remarks to make uh, about my question, and I probably have to change it now. But uh, absolutely, listen to you. Um, it, it's great that we are able to listen to students and students' representation. Um, we, as universities, have to see ourselves as not just uh, a group of academics and a group of non-academics, but also with students. And how we engage with the students is key. Um, in the developments that we do as, as a university and as higher education, um, particularly in what regards to digital transformation. Someone was saying that we already uh, in the we were already overtaken by students in what relation mm -hmm. what, what, what regards uh, AI and all digital aspects of uh, of day to day life. And I would argue thinking about what Mike was saying, I've already mentioned this also. Um, 
we are still looking at AI and digital transformation um, like the way we were teaching 20 years ago. Um, we, we had the same challenge and the same uh, reaction when we started looking at the internet and web 2.0 and Wikipedia. And we were frightened as institutions because we didn't dialogue with students and with the different stakeholders at the university. And so I think starting from that, I think we really need to be open um, and saying that we don't know and that we have to uh, improve and uh, develop ourselves in a conversation with uh, our internal stakeholders, particularly students. And we, we should not be frightened about that, particularly as digital education institutions. And I keep picking up on something that was, um, was said today from the quality assurance. Uh, so for, for Menke, and I will not leave that without, without notice, um, uh, the reference was that a key aspect of, 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 uh, of concern about digital education was uh, the quality of learning, teaching and assessment. And this is not a problem of digital education, it's a problem of higher education as a whole. So uh, I would say that we need to engage the students because those challenges that are kind of micro-credentials and personalization of learning and teaching um, digital transformation of the university, artificial intelligence are all key concepts that we have to dialogue with our stakeholders because in three months' time it will be completely different. We don't know how uh, ChatGPT will develop, we don't know what type of new ChatGPT is will come, and, and so we have to uh, be open, like we are open universities. Mm -hmm. um, on that note, um, Digital transformation for us is, is literally what everything we do uh, as a university and reflects on everything we do as a university. So, um, and, and COVID did have a huge impact on us. So from the way we work, we are much more hybrid now. Uh, Non-academic staff uh, are now also coming only to university a few days uh, um, to, and they are able to, to, to choose whether they want to come a few days or to come all days of the week. Um, to the student's assessment, which we were uh, used to having the, the, the endpoint assessment face to face, now we are doing it online, and we will be keep doing it online, even with ChatGPT, which is best. Um, to QA, quality assurance, everything is digital also, um, you know, dashboards, indicators, benchmarks, and transparent also. also. Um, to all the procedures. and. A lot of it uh, comes obviously from the strategic decision of making everything digital, but also from the requirements, um, both from QA agencies, but also from the government, and from the need to make things more transparent and more effective, um, and more sustainable, I should say. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is the way we are doing this digital transformation is very much actually focused on micro credentials. <laughs> there was a reference to it just before. Um, the way we integrate micro credentials as an institution is to use it also to change the culture and to explain to people what is supposed to be a micro credential. So, engaging with academic staff using micro credentials to train them in pedagogy, for example, or uh, in artificial intelligence, or which, by the way, we didn't have yet the idea of creating <laughs> micro credentials for artificial intelligence and from the start, but we are doing it for, for example, digital assessment, uh, learning and teaching. Um, and what we are seeing is that it actually works and people feel that being able to uh, learn by experiencing what a short learning program is and getting that micro credential is effective and you feel rewards rather than what's happening in a webinar that they have the webinar then they finish the webinar and they apply what they do what they can learn. So I would add with that actually my credentials may be also a way of integrating this transformation in our institutions. Thank you. Uh, Anna. When, after the first year of COVID, we issued in Hagen a manifesto on new learning, because we were convinced that it's not about technology, but it's about the way we conceive learning, and that we have to talk about that. That's exactly what you said about uh, what's going on. And I think that's more true than ever. And we have to talk about what is good learning about. And uh, in this room are many institutions that have that in, in their DNA because they started 
how can I bring this to the student? And we have to cling to this idea. Um, and every round of new techno technological developments makes it more clearer. Um, so if we really take that serious from teaching to learning, if we really take serious what uh, Bologna was about, if you really take serious what the quality assurance one, then we are just there what would make us as institutions successful, but would also help the world as such. <laughs> and I found it very inspiring that this is inter so clearly interconnected, but we really have to free the room for talking about assessments, tutoring, guidance, and not only contents. And uh, the other universities are still preoccupied in um, defending their old world. And we, we can also defend our old world because it was our old world, bring the learning to the learners. And now there are some new techniques to, that, to do that even better. But I think that would be the mission of open universities and it's more true than ever, yeah. Okay. I will try to speak of what I know best and it's not chat GPT. I was taken by surprise. As I realized, and that made me happier, most of us in this room, I think. And that made me feel happier, as I said, uh, <laughs> because uh, I thought I was op you know, into open and distance education. And I was, even though I'm not a computer expert, you know, but I'm a good user, I'm able, I keep abreast of developments, you know, but I was taken by surprise when one of our professors in a faculty meeting told me about ChatGPT and I said, what the heck are we talking about? And then he explained and I was really taken by surprise and he said, let me show you. And he opened up the screen and got me into it and I was really shocked. Apparently it was number one edition. Uh, <laughs> the professor Mike, this is his name from the UK, showed us number four because I got an essay and there were no references. And I said, okay, there's a catch to this. <laughs> now I saw that there are references. <laughs> so we're taken behind. What do I mean by this? Well, we have to become more context sensitive and context responsive when we're in leadership positions and we're not doing enough of this. And that's what I think the message should be for us in leadership positions. Scanning the environment, we're not doing enough of this constantly. Therefore, we have already made a position, so to speak, uh, put not just a committee, but persons or a person whose job is really to scan the environment, newspapers, lawmakers, uh, uh, worldwide, Europe-wide, you know, see what's going on that is going to affect us, who thinks is going to affect us. We're not doing enough of that. We are moving very fast from the agricultural era into the industrial era, into the computers era, and actually we're moving even away from the computers era. We are fast getting into the biogenetics. And I think biogenetics is here to stay. And that's what we're talking about nowadays. So in my view, we're getting into dangerous terrains. And as my colleagues previously spoke, we need to find ways to regulate, but not over-regulate, that is not to kill what's coming. And I mean, artificial intelligence, because over-regulation will kill it, but we do want to regulate. Otherwise, chaos is here to stay. And then complexity theory can do little about it, but not too much about it. So in my university, we have started doing some thinking about this after we had about a month ago, a cyber attack, which was, we were taken by surprise. And there I had to do emergency crisis leadership and decision-making as things were evolving. And I learned the hard way what is this to do management into crisis and into an uncertainty 
as it is evolving right in front of your eyes, meaning having, think of chat, chat GPT when I'm saying this, meaning you have very little evidence, very little information on which you base decisions, and yet you have to move and make decisions that will affect thousands of students, hundreds of personnel, and you have to move and make those decisions and take those responsibilities. That's what we are getting into nowadays, and that's the feeling I'm getting from today's session. And with that, I leave it to ask for further discussion, uh, dear colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I want to open it up to the audience too. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, we are an ecosystem, we are a community. What next steps uh, do we need to take from here, from this morning, and to evolve uh, into a new future? What would be uh, the, the most priority? Uh, what would be a step? Ooh. Difficult one. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I would I would share some some thoughts. I believe that the first thing from a student's perspective is actually to see the use of AI and digitalization through a rights-based approach, or even I would say a human rights-based approach. So that, that means understanding, I mean ensuring access to to equipment, ensuring access to different tools and software and AI, but also uh, training staff and training students on, on the right, rights in digital context and the pitfalls. So we, we all know the pitfalls regarding uh, biases of AI, wrong answers, even discrimination, which is not based on the algorithm itself. It's based on the data set that fits the, the algorithm. And uh, this is also a discussion that has been expanded. So firstly, understanding the rights of all involved, I would say then, from a student's perspective, understanding what brings and what doesn't bring added value, because this goes into the discussion, what is the role of the teachers? We, we have teachers as coaches, as uh, someone who is using AI to direct the learning experience, et cetera. And then we also have, I would say, uh, the, the role of AI, and we say the role of AI in not making decisions, because we, we fear, in a way, that uh, if, uh, AI is able to make decisions, then we would lose the authentic student feedback. We will transform student participation in actually having AI deciding in a way where uh, the, the development of policies would go. And we, we do not see that. But we see, for example, a very good opportunity for using AI in student support services, in career guidance, in uh, issues like that. And regarding the assessment, uh, what we what we see is that we are discussing that we need to revolutionize the assessment for years, and now we are actually forced to do that because of, of AI and uh, basically looking more into learning outcomes and skills rather than just checking uh, uh, achievement to the old way will be made uh, basically impossible. Uh, the old way would be made would be made impossible by by AI. So we these I would say we see as a more, more important issue. And of course, we were discussing about inclusive education. And as ESU, we believe that we should have universal access to free higher education. Uh, and uh, regarding adult learning, we have only 18 countries in Europe which have any policies regarding supporting adults in higher education. So we have 28 if we are considering European higher education area, which have no policy whatsoever as, at, at, at national level. And we need, we need to see, firstly, what is the role of, of the the state in a way, but also what is the role of universities. And I'm, I'm finalizing with, with this, uh, regarding the power, the bargaining power of, of education establishments. Right now, uh, we have the tech sector, which is very big and very strong, and then you have individual universities. What, how much can they shape what is happening? So it is also a method of coalition in a way, in forums like this, to actually see what do we want as the sector and then have a common voice towards it because otherwise if all of all of all of us give the feedback individually it is not the, the same balance to say so as of shaping the tools by the users and in this case i mean users as students of course but also users as uh, education institutions so we we see this as a as a priority as well Hello, uh, comments remarks Takeaways. What do you take uh, home with you? Mm -hmm. I can make an observation to the piece I think. There's a lot, a lot that I just said. Uh, um, 
it seems that the students know better what you need to do than, 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 than us. And this again is quite um, I was while while you were speaking, I was thinking about my colleagues from history, from humanities, and from those different uh, knowledge areas that are difficult to apply, are very theoretical. And what's the future that will come to this to this disciplinary area that are fundamental, they're not uh, applicable? Because it's easy to say, you know, we, we just do assessment based on, on, on skills and we assess students based on skills. But one, we have the problem of size. We are uh, being demand, but we are being required to teach more and more and more students and have a relationship with them that it's um, rather difficult as we as we go along because of the size of the cohorts of students. And two, um, yeah, it's great to, to assess uh, skills, but skills require uh, a lot of one-to-one, uh, -one, a lot of support uh, to students from the are. And that's why uh, health health related courses are the ones that are more expensive because we have that level of, uh, of engagement. Um, I think it's important to reflect on personalization and how we can harness the, uh, the, the, the full the full advantages of AI. And picking up what what well, what Mark Mark was saying, it's very much when you access higher education, what you need from higher education, and how we can in higher education respond to your needs. And to the skills that you need to, or the knowledge that you need to, to develop. But it does raise questions about who we are as universities and what's our role in, in, in society. The other thing I wanted to, to, to reflect on is not just learning and teaching. We are not just teachers, we are also researchers. Mm -hmm. We also transfer knowledge to, to society as a whole. And we also have a role in that. And artificial intelligence is being used at the moment by us. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we say to the, we, 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 it's interesting that you are the one that said have a regulation or regulation to, to AI. We didn't, we didn't address this issue. Um, but um, we are more focused on the every regulation we have for the students than actually for the research that we are doing or the, the transferability of knowledge to, to, to society. I think I'm, I'm looking at your face in your all like little smiles, uh, which I assume that it means that we have been using AI for the for, for the you know day-to-day -day work in some of the things that we are doing. I'm not saying we do research with, with artificial intelligence, but some of the things we do. But the first time I heard about ChatGPT, we were doing our uh, open EU submission application, and someone suggested me, why not asking uh, 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 ChatGPT to to define your learning object, sorry, your um, work package objectives as a smart uh, objective? And I asked him, and he did ask, you know, help me to understand what the smart objective is. Um, so we're doing it. So why not taking advantage of it and using it as students? I keep saying this again. It's about co-creation. You know, using Humboldt's Humboldt's view of higher education mm -hmm. and coming back to the point from 200 years ago, what higher education was. It's supposed to be a place, a safe place where we can experiment with our students. And we are so concerned about what it is think about what we do that we focus on having regulating ourselves rather than in our picking up on on what uh, uh, the representation from Enka was saying. <laughs> Do not over regulate, regulate my credentials. I would say don't over regulate artificial intelligence and the new development of that. Anna, one final comment and then we go to the last session. No, after you. Both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Both. Anyway. And I think <clears throat> what is uh, for me very intriguing is to think of the empowerment via quality assurance in all that. Because um, you said uh, we have to see the environment. That's a leadership task. What is going on in the environment and how can I transform this into the institution? Yeah. Because they, they don't look at that all the time. But we, have, we are translators of this outside world. And maybe as a good mechanism, the quality assurance could help us because quality is the, the reputation is, is, is the currency of higher education. And this is transported by a quality assurance systems. And fitness of purpose is the basic. So we always have to ask, what is this model for? What is this program for? 
and skills can also be very theoretical. Mm -hmm. It might not be only applied, but you have to answer the question, what is the purpose of that? And then you can go on and then quality evolves and maybe that helps us with these new methods, formats mm -hmm. and, and te technology that we have now. In a sense, taking from where Ada left it, what I meant by this is becoming more of entrepreneurial leaders, not entrepreneurial leaders, but entrepreneurial leaders. And that's a term that we've been working with with a German mm -hmm. colleague of mine in the last four or five years. And by that, we mean the educational and the entrepreneurial meaning university leaders and universities nowadays should be looking inside, meaning the educational mm -hmm. environment, improving and working on that, but at the same time, entrepreneurial, looking on the outside and working in liaison with that. They are the persons or the teams that will bring those two together. If those two are not in alignment, we cannot really survive today's complexities that, and uncertainties that we live in. At the same time, while doing that, we should be walking away from administrivia. Again, a term we have coined several years ago, and that goes back to what you said about Germany, not overdoing it with administrivia. You know what administrivia means. And that means killing whatever we're trying to create. If we try to balance those two, then I think we can make it through the 21st or 22nd century. Thank you. That is a nice uh, wrap up when we yes. finish. Uh, I thank the panel for all the wisdom. I thank everybody who contributed to this morning. I look at Pete and George and the supervisor board. We are very happy with this morning, but we are always very happy with ourselves. So if you are, <laughs> if you are not, please let us know because then we can ch make changes in the next summer. That will be next year. But if you can miss EDU, of course, just look at the website. There are a lot of activities. and. Uh, don't forget, at the end of the year, uh, we have our annual conference, and this time it's in Turkey, and we're looking forward. Uh, 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 you are hosting it, so, so we can't wait uh, to visit you uh, uh, at our annual conference. So uh, I hope to see you there, at least there. For now, uh, um, have a nice network lunch. Uh, for all the board members, you still have a general assembly and a rector's meeting. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here and uh, thank you everybody for participating and I'll see you next time. <laughs>